Good morning, friends. Welcome to our service for the weekend of Sunday, August the 8th. There are a lot of you that are coming and going. Social media updates and photos being shared are confirming that there are some of you really enjoying your summer holidays. I've heard stories of times at the lake, cabins, family gatherings, weddings, the chances to do some of the things you love that you didn't get to do last summer are being taken advantage of this time. I know some of you are off. You're in teaching, you're students, you have an extended break with family right now. I know others of you are working through the summer and so the chance for those types of breaks is less, but I hope that all of you are finding ways to make July and August into special months as we enjoy a little more freedom than we've enjoyed in the past year. Keep an eye on our church calendar. Remember that we have outdoor gatherings happening every weekend through July and August. You'll see that information on your screen right now. And you'll see this weekend's event highlighted that we have a time of worship and communion happening in the park outside our church building at 4 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. This weekend, that's being led by Jonathan Sloka. And so thank you, Jonathan, for prayerfully preparing thoughts and songs that can gather people in worship at a time around communion. Thank you to those of you who can participate and enjoy that time of sharing with one another. Take note of those coming weeks and take note that the list is getting quite short, right? Here we are, August 8, and then 15, and then 22, and then 29, and then be reminded that September the 5th, that's the Sunday of Labor Day weekend, we have a pancake breakfast scheduled with our church family, and so there's already a sign-up opportunity in last week's church email to let us know that you plan to come. We know that's a busy weekend. It's the Labor Day weekend for the campers among us. That's often the last chance to get in some camping time. We know that it's a time when families sometimes gather in other spots, that some of you are focused on a football game, that there's other ways that weekend's being spent. But if you are able to join us for our pancake breakfast on the morning of Sunday, September 5th, please follow the instructions in last week's email to sign up so that we can prepare accurately and adequately for everyone. And then be reminded that September the 12th is our return service. We will be back in our building gathering in worship and communion, and it will be quite a special time to be back together in that way after many, many months of not. And so remember, there's also a survey as we look at September 12th, but beyond we want your input and so we've created a very brief survey it's only three questions and takes only a few clicks to complete but if you haven't done that yet we'd love to hear from you and your family so that we can make preparations to have things well ordered so that everyone feels safe and well looked after as we resume our weekend gatherings in the month of september and beyond one final reminder is that there are three ways to participate in our offering each weekend. And thank you to all who are faithfully, generously giving to the work of Glen Elm, to the things God is doing in us and through us. Those ways are on your screen. And if you would like to join in this weekend, then those will show you how. I think we've covered all of our details, and so I want to turn our attention to this week's episode of Grow TV. Remember that we're in a mini-series titled Famous, where we're looking at one of the most famous families in the Old Testament, and today's story takes us into the life of Solomon with a very valuable big idea. Let's watch together. Hey there, Little Chicken Nuggets. It's me, Carl. Welcome to Grow. Hosted by Carl, where we have fun with our friends, talk about Jesus, and go over everything the Bible has to offer. Now, once again, welcome to Pro TV. <sighs> well, I know y'all probably expected me to be famous by now, for me to have millions of views on my dancing video and for companies begging me to be their spokesperson. Well, I guess I have news for you. That's exactly what happened! <laughs> so let me tell you what happened. Last week I was there finishing up Grow TV. I looked at my phone and I saw I had over a thousand notifications. Apparently someone famous saw my video and decided to share it. And that led thousands upon millions of other people to see it. Now there's companies all over wanting me 
Coral to be the face of their organization. Isn't this incredible? I'm becoming famous. I mean, look at this. I got a fancy new vest as a gift and these special new glasses. Uh. Oh, and I can't forget this. I tell you what, things are changing big time. But I gotta be honest, I need your help with something. Now all famous people have agents. People that kinda just like make sure you get whatever you want, right? So I got an agent. Come on in here, Sebastian. Hey there, cool Carl. How you doing, man? Good to see you. You're hey. a rock star. Yeah. So tell me, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Hey, uh, by the way, did I get that audition for that movie? Shocknado 3000, The Return of the Sea Otter? That's, that's the one, yeah. Oh yeah, we're gonna get you in that for sure, as long as you don't mind getting eaten by a 2,000 pound stingray. Well, actually, I prefer it. Perfect, that's why I love you. Get the stingray ready! All right, Carl, hit me with it. What can I do for my biggest star? Well, I was curious, like, what kind of, like, stuff can I have? Is there, like, a budget or, like, a limit? Do turtles wish they could fly? I have no idea. They do not, okay? No budgets, no limits. Whatever your tiny little bearded heart wants, it gets, all right? Now hit me with it. Anything I want, huh? Huh, all right. Well, I guess I want a swimming pool with jello filled. A bathtub that's just filled with chicken nuggets. A lawnmower that can go underwater. A submarine that can drive on land. A deer that calls me Sir Winston. A talking deer. Is that it? Uh, how about an assistant that's only job is to slap mosquitoes off me? Oh, I have the perfect guy. His name is Slappin' Jimmy. You'll love him. Anything else? Nope. I think that's it. Great. I'll make it happen, okay? All right. Give me Slappin' Jimmy. I don't care if he's in the middle of surgery. I would eat him. Sebastian's crazy. But I love them. <laughs> wow, I can't believe it's really happening. I'm becoming famous, and I get to have whatever I want. Kind of reminds me of a Bible story. You know, it sounds a lot like today's story. Oh, hey, Andy. Hey, Carl. Today's story is actually about another man who was asked what he wanted. Oh, nice. I can't wait. Me either. So today's story is in 1 Kings, and it starts with the end of David's reign as king of Israel. Unfortunately, David died after being king for 40 years in Israel. Now, if you remember from last week, there was an issue with who would be taking over as king after David was gone. But at the end of the story, it became very clear about who was going to be the next king. And the next king would be, drum roll please, Solomon. Now, a lot of people don't remember, but Solomon was very, very young when he became king. Y'all want to guess how old he was? I'll wait. Got your guess? He was 12 years old. Now, I don't know about you, but I think when I was 12, I was rolling around in the dirt as a kid, uh, pretending I was a carrot. So, I could not have been a king uh, at all. But Solomon was. Now, when you think about what you would do as your first day as a king or a queen, you'd probably make some new laws first, right? Like everyone has to eat dessert first before they eat dinner or no bedtimes before midnight, or maybe that every single person who is mean has to eat broccoli for a week. But you know what Solomon did first? He made sacrifices to honor God and his father. How cool is that? I think God was very happy that Solomon was king because when he was sleeping, God spoke to him in a dream. Solomon was asked what was something that he wanted from God. Now Solomon could have asked for anything in the whole entire world. He could have asked for all the land or to be the richest man in the world or to even be the biggest and strongest king on the planet. But you know what Solomon asked for? He asked for wisdom. You see, Solomon was young. He was only 12 years old and now he was leading thousands and thousands of people. He was gonna need some help to make the right decisions and to know what's the difference between right and wrong. And also just to be the best leader for his people. So you could probably imagine that God was super happy that Solomon asked for wisdom over everything else. So pleased that God not only gave Solomon the wisdom that he asked for, but so much more than that. God gave Solomon an overwhelming amount of wealth and riches and honor. God was making sure that there would be no greater king in his time. And God told Solomon if he listened and obeyed God, then he would have a long life just like his father did. Isn't that incredible? I mean, Solomon, a 12-year-old kid who takes over the position of his father as king, who was probably the greatest king of all time, had just had the opportunity to ask for anything in the whole entire world. And instead of asking for money or, or land or castles or whatever, he asked for wisdom. Then God rewards him in a massive way. And there's another pretty cool thing that there's another storyteller in the Bible named James. And he tells us that if we pray for wisdom, God promises us that we will receive it. How cool is that? I mean, we can have wisdom from God just like Solomon did, but we have to ask for it. And so when I look at this story, all I can think about is how when we need help, we can ask God for guidance.
All right, you big stars. Our big idea today is when we need help, we can ask God for guidance. All right, I'll say it out loud on the count of three. One, two, three. When we need help, we can ask God for guidance. Great job, everyone. Isn't that just the best news ever? Speaking of needing help, Carl, how you doing? I'm a changed man. Nothing but caviar dreams and chicken nugget living from now on. I can't wait to see where this fame's gonna take me. Get excited, kids, because it's gonna be fun. Yeah. Thank you for watching, and tune in next week for a new episode of Road Do you remember the big idea that was just shared with us? When we need help, we can ask God for guidance. This is a great big idea and is not just for us when we're little. In our summer series, we've been hearing from some of the members and friends of our church family under the title, One Thing I Have Learned. And this weekend, we have opportunity to hear from Karen Vogel. Tony and Karen had signed up quickly. They had some things they wished to share. Life has moved in such a way that Tony was unavailable. But thank you, Karen, for taking the time to organize some thoughts, to sift through some experiences and to give us something really valuable this morning. I felt multiple points of connection with Karen's sharing as I listened to it the first time, and I'm confident that you will find it valuable to your journey, that it will draw your eyes to Jesus, draw your eyes to the Lord, and even drill home that idea that when we need help, we can come to the Lord for guidance. Karen's going to highlight that we need quite a bit from him don't we? And so thank you, Karen. Bless you as you share. Bless you, friends, as you listen. Here's a recent sharing from Karen Vogel. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be able to talk to you via um, a video. We are in Kamloops and it is smoky. And yes, uh, not to create a picture that isn't real it's so smoky i haven't been out in days um but i we are praying for the rain praying for the firefighters and it's a new experience for me because i've never lived in this situation tony has and he's way more encouraging saying it'll pass it'll pass um so yeah that's our reality but that's okay um Jason asked both of us to do this, and um, Tony's working all the time, which is good for our family, but um, I have more time on my hands because I have not yet to find that purposeful, professional, and uh, peaceful job that I keep praying for, but I trust it'll come. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is, and it seems such an easy thing, but one thing for sure I know for sure is that I'm not in control. Um, God is in control of everything. And it sounds easy, but if you've had um, relationship issues, either with your a spouse or uh, a person or a, somewhere at work or a child, Oh, it can be it can be more difficult and sometimes it's a flippant statement to just say God is in control God is in control uh, if you were raised by post-war parents um, and I was especially more my father he you know he really believed in output outcome but then later in life he realized sometimes it's not all about the output really bad things can happen to you, whether it's even, I would say it's disillusionment. It's like either a disunion with the church group or a diversion in your life plans, like your mom dies or, or uh, your wife dies, your husband dies. And sometimes with disillusionment comes detachment and disintegration and and i've seen this happen now when i was at the school working at the school i've seen it happening in churches where people just quit going because there's some disillusionment um i've seen it happen in with me with some of my relationships um and what i'm trying to say is 
I think that we have to give up, like lay down how it's all up to us. I wish there was more classes on Christian parents, um, either, I don't care how old, where some of their children are no longer going to church. It's like we don't even have support groups to, to help our hearts because it's not about how good we were as a parent or how bad we were as a parent because I can say this being raised as an only child. I know families of five, six or seven where four remained with Christ and two aren't there or none are there. And I think we have to give that up too. Like there's a lot of shame in not producing outcomes, whether it's we should be at a job we're supposed to be at at this phase of our life, whether it's a, um, we should have a, in our minds, we should have everybody on the pew right now with their husbands, with their kids. There's a lot of controlling with that. I, I've spent, it's like different times in my life, I've spent time and people who know me well, I pick a word each year because I get overwhelmed, I can't, and then I get, I get, um, uh, how do I, I get disillusioned, that's the funny part. So there's been times where intention was my word, or peace was my word. My word for this year is, is really concentrating on my thoughts. And there's a lot of stuff, which is great, like on Netflix about law of attraction, thoughts or things. Um, but there's still a lot of control. If you look at that, it's all based on how well you can control it. This year also, um, through the support of my husband's example, I have committed every day to pray and work through different um, Bible a Bible, um, test, like books that have helped me about just giving up control and the disillusionment of how I thought things should be. When uh, I like words and with all the negative words I talked about, about disillusionment, there's some really nice words. They're the opposite of disillusion and that is connection new beginnings, commencement of something, construction of something new, and unification. You know, I remember thinking there might, some of you, especially in the Glen Elm Church of Christ, I don't, I don't ever remember a time when you were rebellious, meaning you weren't not in the pew. And I think that you really need a hug for showing up, for just showing up, because who knows what was going on in your life. But the church is a place where we should be able to worship and grow closer to God and, and kind of lay aside the disillusionment of our pastors, our elders, our programming, our this or that, because it's really disillusionment. At the end of the day, that's a control thing too. It's not how I want it, when I want it, where I want it. And it's, I, th I just know that, the, that it's kind of a useless exercise, but when you're trying to connect, you're more gracious for families that don't have their kid in the pew. You're more gracious to families that have broken hearts because of divorce in their family. What about the families whose kids aren't married yet and they're beautiful men and women, beautiful, who haven't had their soulmate? That carries a hurt in our hearts. When I went to um, th uh, therapy at the Caring Place after Western, uh, uh, one of the counselors put me through a really amazing visualization and he's a Christ believer, but he made me shut everyone out of my room. Like he got rid of the people that would be known to me because of Western, the parents of the kids, the kids themselves, the board, just get them out of my room. Then he took uh, my family, my like direct 
family out of the room. Then I got rid of my friends that were all telling, they got him, them out of the room. Then they got um, my children out of the room. And then they got uh, my ex-husbands and my failures out of the room per se, that it wasn't all a failure. Um, and then he got me toe to toe with Jesus Christ. And I remember him saying, all of this is distraction and disillusionment. Now you're toe to toe. Start talking to Jesus. Start talking to him that releases all of this stuff and hear what he wants, hear what he's saying to you. And you know what? He says the same thing over and over in scripture, you know, you know, fear not for I've redeemed you. I have called you by name. He gets rid of everything that was behind me. And he does the opposite of disillusionment. He gives me a new beginning. He gives me new friends. He gives me a new worship song to put in my heart. He gives me um, new beginnings. And this isn't because I have to visualize to materialize and all that law of attraction this is because we are loved we are forgiven and when i understand more and more that the more we empty ourselves or like what we watched last sunday where you take the backpack off your back the more you empty yourself the more you have joy and you have to believe that Christ shines in the darkness just because our kids aren't where we want them or where maybe our marriage isn't where it's supposed to be or we're not getting what we want when we want it. I think that if we really relinquish of the control and the disillusionment and really be open to possibilities and asking and believing that we will receive it, that like starts to heal our, our heart, makes us less anxious. Um, it makes us grow. And I do think we should not be so hard on ourselves. Like I had a huge milestone when I went out to see Jessica Jessica in itself was a huge milestone and it's an inch in a relationship where where there has been some disillusion and disappointment. So, but even more, I had a little win because I saw my ex-husband all over the house and I felt kindness and I felt fine and I even felt connection and I even felt, I felt like in the detachment and all the negative words or the disintegration, everything that happened, I feel like I was at a point where it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. But that's, that's going to be okay. I also know, and I've said this before, but I think being around Christian believers is so important because they will give you words of encouragement and love. And then I just hear, heard a little voice, maybe not all the time. But again, I really believe that the Christians that are showing up at our churches, they do believe in Jesus Christ and they do believe he's coming back. And all we can control is our own be behavior of showing up, um, being gracious, throw an olive branch. Uh, and this is easier said than done. Let old dogs lie, as they said. But I think the more that scripture is in us, the more we trust him with the things that are going our way or out of our control. And... If I, if there's one thing I've learned is that I've learned that um, being out of control can be good too because there are things that will happen in your life that you had no idea was a part of your plan. 
And the less we try to save our life or hang on to our life, I think we do lose it. And I think that when we hang on to Jesus, we will have a life that it's not all roses, but there is an ending that I don't think any of us want to miss. On the heels of Karen's sharing, I think our worship fits really well right here. And so I've got two songs ready for us. These are well-known songs. Most of you will have no trouble singing along. The first one's being led by two American friends. They host a podcast called Two Catholic Dudes, which makes me smile for a number of reasons. And then the second song is being led by a very talented family from the Philippines who devote much time and energy to placing resources of worship on the internet for their nation and the nations around the world. And so we are blessed by these people today. Let's see if we can't make these two songs an expression of our own personal desire to give control to the Lord as we come to him for all we need. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God. Sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. It's where you are, Lord. It's Christ in me Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Teach my soul to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need 
Defense my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. still ringing in our minds and in our hearts. Let me show you a very short video from Francis Chan. This is him being interviewed for a project he was a part of in which he was asked to compare control and surrender. And so this is only a few minutes long, but it will set us up well to move into our communion time. Watch with me. Calling on why we're meant to do isn't biblical and contrast that with the life God designed us to live. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Are we, we good? good now? Yeah. yeah. You know, when most people talk about the American dream, it's uh, it's about safety, security. You know, I want to grow old with my kids, grandkids, have all sorts of money, and it, it's all about the here and now. So it's it's antithetical to Scripture, where Jesus says, "Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me." He didn't uh, invite the disciples into the American dream. He invited them into a, a life of suffering. Um, in fact, the scriptures teach that anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So we're, we're kind of signing up for a war, you, you, you know, the American dream versus this spiritual warfare that we're in. And so anyone that spent any time in the New Testament can see that, you know, following Christ isn't easy. In fact, the people that were begging him to follow, you know, saying, I, I want to follow you. Jesus says, you, you sure? Because the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Like, if you follow me, we're homeless tonight. And so you're really leaving things up in the air rather than controlling them, which is what the American dream is all about, is I have control over my life. I've got everything set up for the rest of my life. That's the dream, is absolute control versus absolute surrender. Could you talk about lordship and mm -hmm. obedience and saying yes mm -hmm. to the Lord, that there be no no's left in our heart? All right. You know, when Jesus called people to himself, it was a call to follow him. He just said, follow me. Um, it's implied in there clearly this sense of lordship of he's our master, I go where he tells me to go. That's why he asks questions like, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Because this doesn't make sense. You're giving me this lip service of you're calling me Lord, and yet you're not doing what I ask you to do. And so I remember when I was younger, there was a big debate. I, I, I think it's died out by now. But back in the day, it was like, well, can you accept him as Savior, but not as Lord? Can you say, okay, I want you to save me, but I don't want to follow you? And I think back then there was actually the belief of, oh, yeah, sure, we can follow him as Savior. And then later on, we can decide whether or not we want him as our Lord. I think most of that's died out and we see the foolishness of it. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And where can we find any type of biblical mandate or, or promise that all we have to do is have this intellectual assent and say, yeah, I want him to be my savior, but I have no desire to follow him. How can anyone read the New Testament and get that solution? It was just something that we wanted. It's like, well, can I still control my life and just have the assurance that I'm not going to hell? Uh, that's that's basically what we were what we were after, and what I love about this generation is they're reading scripture for themselves. They're seeing the obvious, like, well, of course he's Lord, he's God, he's in control. We fear him, we follow him, we love him. We, the, the whole idea of trusting him is saying, you know what? I trust your commands will actually lead to life. I actually trust that if I lose my life, I'm actually going to find it because that's what you told me. So let me let go, surrender. And this is a little scary because we're all about control. And it's like, okay, you're my new master. I've just surrendered myself to you. That's what it means. That's what baptism was. I am dying to myself. That means I'm giving up control. Francis is no longer alive. Now it's Christ who lives in me. So take me where you want me to go because I trust this is going to be a better life for me. Um, this, is, this is the way to fulfillment, the, the full abundant life that Christ talks about, which doesn't mean it's always going to be easiest. In fact, most of the time it's not. And doesn't mean that it's the most fun all of the time because it does include pain and suffering and sacrifice. But the conclusion will always be our blessing. Even the suffering is going to be more abundant than us holding on to our lives, controlling our own lives and our destiny and saying, no, Jesus, I surrender to you. Earlier this summer, I was reading a book where a fellow was scanning the New Testament and this theme of control. And one of the things he pointed out that struck me is he said, Jesus talked a lot about surrender, about faith, 
about trust. And many of his listeners had trouble with the concept, or maybe they could understand it in their heads, but they didn't really want to embrace it. And so the writer said that as he looked at the interactions Jesus had with other people, that he noticed that typically it was the people who might be called rich or the people who might be called religious who had the greatest trouble in embracing this message of trust or surrender. Because in the times of Jesus, those were two ways in which you might work to control things that are happening, right? The rich pile up resources thinking they can insulate and protect themselves from a trouble and thinking they can use those resources to get what they want when they want. And the religious, maybe not given to the material side of it, but now having different ways, systems in which they might control what happens in their life, in which they might actually become God in some way through their own goodness, through their own knowledge, through their own quality. And so Jesus interacted with many people, but it was often the rich and the religious who struggled most to hear and embrace this truth, that a key concept within the life of a disciple, within any who wish to walk with Jesus, is to have the ability to release things, to embrace things, to receive things, to hold things loosely, and to walk in childlike trust step by step. When I was a kid going to church, this time of our service was often called the Lord's Supper. In my childhood church, we had quite a simple piece of furniture at the front, which we literally called the Lord's Table. It was the piece of furniture which would hold the body and the blood of Jesus before we shared in them together. And the Lord's table is such a simple phrase, but it's a good reminder, right? Whose table do you come to today? Whose supper, whose meal do you partake of? Whose body and blood do you receive? None of it's yours, none of it's mine, none of it's ours. It's all given, it's all provided. If there is a host, it is him. If there are guests, it is us. And so we come in this humble, built right into the vocabulary posture that we come with needs. And so it reminds us every single week, come empty-handed, with your questions, with your wounds, with your brokenness, come. You don't have to have all the answers. You won't. You don't have to have it all together. You won't. Just come and receive. Thank you, Father, that you lovingly provide what we need. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you take delight in sharing yourself, sharing what is yours freely with us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for renewing us, for rebirthing us, for teaching us every day how to walk in a life of trust and surrender. Please teach us more today. We have yet to much to learn. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to feel unrushed in your observing of communion, then press pause here. Take all the time you want. If you're done with today's video, you can move on to something else to close your time. If you let this play out, we're going to tag on a song that's become quite special to me in the last year, hopefully to you as well. Jesus strong and kind. Why would we come to him? Why would a needy person run to Jesus? Because he is those things. He's strong. He can provide what we need. But he's also kind. He's willing and good to provide what we need. And if I find myself in a state of need, I want somebody who is both capable and willing. And so Jesus, strong and kind, might settle those truths into our mind and our heart again as we partake. Thank you, friends, for gathering online. Thank you, Karen, for sharing of your heart and your journey with us. We will meet again online next week. And until we do, may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Bless you, friends. Jesus said that it
Jesus said, if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful, he will keep us day. can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to Him. He showed 